Good afternoon and welcome to the 14th Peter M. Wege Lecture on Sustainability at the University of Michigan, which will be presented shortly by former President Jose Fugueras of Costa Rica. My name is Greg Keolian, and I'm professor at the School of Natural Resources and Environment and director of the Center for Sustainable Systems. This Peter M. Wege Lecture Series focuses on critical issues of sustainability and honors Peter Wege for his many contributions to the Center for Sustainable Systems, the School of Natural Resources and Environment, and the University of Michigan. Since its beginning in 2000, this lecture series has covered a wide set of topics, ranging from sustainable transportation, to energy and climate change, to biomimicry, children's health, and an Earth Day reflections by the Dalai Lama. Today's important topic is carbon reduction. This lecture is being presented and sponsored by the center and the school. We wish to thank Peter Wege and the Wege Foundation for their endowment, which helped make this event possible. While Peter passed away two years ago, his philosophy towards the environment continues to be carried out by the foundation that bears his, its name. We'd like to show a short video that captures Peter's spirit and passion for the environment this time. The steel case started green in 1970, actually. We didn't know what green meant at that time, but oh, we tried to improve all of all, everything we could uh, in the process of making furniture to, to make it safe. We had local people, we had students, and we had professors, and we had the University of Michigan and other people like that working on projects that we were trying to solve. One was air, water, uh, clean air, clean water, and uh, the proper disposal of waste. That's how we started. And uh, so people were not doing that in those days, and we didn't have the EPA at that time to really uh, say you, you can't do that anymore. You're creating all the bad stuff that has to be cleaned up. Why not do it right in the first place? So that's where we started, 1970. Do all the good you can for all the people you can for as long as you can. Just if you did that in your life, just think of what would happen. That gives you a, 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 an appreciation for Peter. Um, I will say one more thing. I'll, I'll share a, one of his uh, quotes that he often used. Go blue, think green. That was Peter Wege. I mean, at this time, I'd like to introduce President Mark Schlissel, who will then introduce our speaker. President Schlissel is the 14th president of the University of Michigan and a true champion of sustainability on our campus ecosystem. He understands the important and vital role that interdisciplinary research and education plays in addressing critical sustainability challenges of our time. Through his leadership, many new sustainability initiatives have been launched across the campus, from the Mobility Transformation Center to a zero waste program at the Michigan Stadium. And there is a recent initiative to reduce carbon emissions from electricity um, on our campus uh, through upgrades of the central power plant. And this relates directly to the theme of our lecture today. Uh, there's many uh, impressive accomplishments and achievements prior to coming to the University of Michigan. Um, I'm not gonna go into that list, um, but I am gonna send, I'm gonna end by this introduction by uh, saying one thing personal about the president. So you ready for, okay. <laughs> So the president's wife is an environmental and energy lawyer. So sustainability is deeply, deeply rooted in his family. Um, so 
With that, please uh, join me in welcoming President Schlissel. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much, Greg, for that very kind uh, introduction. I'll, I'll tell my wife you gave her a shout out as well. You know, who gets to listen to a sustainability talk in the afternoon and then go home at night and hear more about it as well? So, uh, but thank you also for your outstanding work uh, here on campus. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Mark Van Putten, uh, the new CEO of the Weggie Foundation and former CEO of the National Wildlife Foundation. The late Peter Weggie was one of the University of Michigan's dearest friends, and we're proud to continue our partnership with the foundation to carry forward Peter's vision for a better world. The foundation has supported numerous environmental programs in Costa Rica, and its support for our School of Natural Resources and the Environment over many years has been essential to the University of Michigan's leadership in several related disciplines. Both Peter and the foundation also deserve a great deal of credit for a very special upcoming milestone here on our campus. This fall, the University of Michigan Center for Sustainable Systems will be celebrating its 25th anniversary. I congratulate Dr. Keolian, Professor Emeritus Jonathan uh, Bulkley, and the center's students, faculty, and staff, and supporters for a quarter century of commitment to education, innovation, and thoughtful examination of some of the most important issues of our time. The center is a terrific example of the benefits that a great research university can provide our society. When we leverage the remarkable breadth of the academic portfolio like the University of Michigan's, we can bring incredible intellectual resources to bear on the biggest challenges and opportunities confronting modern society. Broad interdisciplinary collaboration is crucial because the greatest problems in the world don't know what discipline they're supposed to fall into. They're just problems. The center brings together researchers from eight University of Michigan schools and colleges to advance concepts of sustainability through interdisciplinary research and education. Working with the center, students from our School of Natural Resources and the Environment created the sustainability assessment and reporting framework that informed major portions of our campus sustainability goals including those in carbon reduction. Today's Wege lecturer him, has himself worked to bring together the world's greatest minds to find solutions that will advance sustainability, economic prosperity, and human well-being. As president of Costa Rica from 1994 to 1998, Jose Maria Figueres led the nation to fully embrace economic growth that was anchored in the values of environmental sustainability. The nation's eco-travel industry has since been valued in the billions of dollars, and the effort has led to a tourism program that is both internationally competitive and responsive to local needs. A 2012 article in The Guardian reported that Costa Rica went from being in danger of losing all its forests to a country that had set aside 25% of its lands for national parks and protected areas. In describing the change in his country, he said that it is an ethical and moral necessity to be efficient with natural resources. Mr. Figueres is renowned as a pioneer in linking sustainable development and technology, and he's worked tirelessly to advance the idea that the planet and the private sector will only truly succeed together. Since leaving the presidency, he's held leadership positions in some of the most influential organizations on the globe, including the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, and the Global Ocean Commission. In 2009, he joined the Carbon War Room, an organization whose founders include Sir Richard Branson. Its mission is to accelerate the adoption of business solutions that reduce carbon emissions at gigaton scale and advance the low carbon economy. Mr. Figueres earned his engineering degree from the US Military Academy at West Point and a master's in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Friends and colleagues, please help me welcome the 2016 Wegi lecturer, Jose Maria Figueres. 
sir. Thank you, Thank sir. you so much. Buenas tardes, amigas y amigos. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí con, con nosotros. President Schlissel, Dr. Kiorian, President Van Putin, it is very much an honor to be here this evening and share some thoughts on sustainability, the challenges ahead, and more than the challenges, the opportunities for the world to move towards an eco-efficient, low-carbon economy. Let me uh, mention four special appreciations. The first one is to all of you, queridas amigas y amigos, for being here this evening. I have to share with you that I am uh, somewhat apprehensive of lectures at this time of the day Um, from, an early, from a very early experience in my career, it happens that I had uh, recently graduated from the academy, was back in Costa Rica, um, a country with no army, as you know. Uh, but how uh, West Point graduates, Costa Ricans that have no army, is another story for another day. <laughs> uh, and I was working as an engineer in a agro business in Costa Rica that also had a field in plastics. And there came this invitation from a company that I will always recall because of its generosity for the invitation called Heimant to join them at one of these global affairs that they were putting together in Calgary towards the end of February. Now, <laughs> the invitation uh, very rapidly went down from the group CEO, to the head of procurement, to the head of manufacturing, to the plant manager, to the most recent engineer, yours truly. <laughs> And I did not understand at that point in time, until I got to Calgary, why this invitation had managed to work its way to my desk in a matter of hours. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, believing as I continue to do today that Life is a glass, at least half full. I, of course, took advantage of this opportunity, put together a brilliant, stellar presentation on the future of plastics in Costa Rica, which, of course, has really no future. We import all of it. But nevertheless, we manufactured polypropylene bags, and off I went to Calgary. So I then discovered, when I got out of the airport, with those temperatures in Calgary, at the end of February, why I had taken this invitation and not somebody else in the company. But nevertheless, I proceeded at the end of the day, five o'clock, into, thank God, a much smaller auditorium than this one. And uh, as I was walking down to deliver my presentation, there was one gentleman in the audience, <laughs> which again then shows my appreciation for all of you here this <laughs> evening. Uh, when I was walking down uh, President Schlissel, I very rapidly said to myself, I have uh, three alternatives. One, I can proceed to deliver my lecture on the brilliant future of plastics in Costa Rica. Uh, two, I can pretend that I entered the wrong auditorium, <laughs> walk right back out, and when there is no lecturer, there will be no lecture. Um, three, I can also sit down next to this gentleman and wait for the lecturer to come in. And when he doesn't show up, we'll both walk out. So uh, I recalled uh, duty on our country uh, at my alma mater, the Military Academy, and proceeded to deliver a slightly abbreviated uh, presentation on the future of the plastics industry in Costa Rica. So I finished my presentation, I walked down, The man starts generously clapping. As I walk up the aisle, I say, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I continue to walk up, and then he says, where are you going? And I said, well, there's a cocktail after this. He says, no, 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 you can't go. I'm the next lecturer here. <laughs> 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 
So after that, ladies and gentlemen, really uh, a heartfelt thank you to all of you for being here today. Let me also thank the uh, Weggy Foundation, uh, President von Putin. Uh, you have been uh, generous, uh, not only in terms of what you have done in these uh, latitudes and longitudes, but also, of course, what you have done in Costa Rica in terms of facilitating bioprospecting bio and really being very much of a thought leader behind the initiatives that drove us back in 94 and 95 to put together a system for the payment of environmental services, which today is a model in the world of how to go about it. Uh, you have also helped us with the Earth University, which is stellar in what it does. Thank you to the Center for Sustainable Systems and to the School of Natural Resources and Environment, querido Dr. Keodium. Uh, it is a privilege, as I mentioned, to be with you. No better place to have this ongoing conversation on sustainability, particularly in the new economic opportunities of a post-fossil fuel era, than to have that conversation here with all of you. Let me lay out my thesis or my principal argument. I believe very strongly that sustainability is the only winning strategy in terms of development, especially in our times, and that the only way forward is towards a low carbon economy. 200 years of industrial revolution are over. And just as we left the Stone Age, not necessarily because we ran out of stones, but because we found something better, this time around, we're going to leave a lot of fossils, carbon, coal, oil, gas, in the ground as we move on to something much better. So welcome to the beautiful and profitable world of low carbon emissions that we are building together. I would like to present the arguments for thinking this way by very rapidly recapping the last 20 years, where we're coming from, where we are today, and what the next 20 years as a important window of opportunity offers us. So in the last 20 years, very briefly, uh, until 2007, uh, we all are aware that we enjoyed about 15 years or at least a decade of tremendous global economic growth around the world. The developed world grew as we would have expected, the US, uh, Europe, OECD nations, but other parts of the world grew as well. If you look back on that decade of growth between, before 2007, Africa grew an average of four to five percent. Latin America grew between five and seven percent on average. And of course, the champions of growth were our Asian friends growing between eight and 10 percent per year. That enabled us to lift millions of peoples out of poverty in the developing world. But for the first time ever in the history of humanity, it also enabled us to move 500 million people in a very short period of time into a new global middle class. Mainly China, almost 300 million, India, almost 200 million, and a few dozen mil millions sprinkled in Latin America, Africa, and elsewhere. I mention that because it has important consumption patterns for the economy and for the world as we move forward. If a Martian had been sitting on the uh, side of Mars there, right on the edge of Mars, looking down at planet Earth, he could have probably said something like, hmm, Homo sapiens has finally got its act together. They have assembled a giant manufacturing and factory in Asia. They have giant markets for consumption in Europe and the US. And in the middle, 
everybody is partaking in business and doing a lot better. Then came 2008, the global economic crisis, which very differently from crisis before was created in the center, in the developed world, and then spread to the periphery. As a consequence of that, we resurrected Keynes because we were going to spend our way out of the crisis, with which some countries did better than others. Some invested in infrastructure, Korea. Some only spent the money uh, and ended up in a much worse position. And a much more serious problem that evolved as a consequence of this economic crisis, which is, of course, the problem of unemployment, which today is worldwide, except perhaps for the United States, which has gradually been able to bring it back in under to more acceptable percentages. But unemployment today in Europe is uh, still a very challenging problem with some countries bearing the brunt, such as Spain, where unemployment is between 24 and 27 percent, over 50 percent for youth, or my own country, which is at 10 percent unemployment, 20 percent amongst youth. The tragedy about this is that unless we're able to recuperate through a growing economy and provide jobs, we risk losing an entire generation. If that same Martian sitting on the edge of Mars were looking at the world during these years of the economic crisis, he could have probably said, interesting what's happening down on planet Earth. It looks like the governments stepped in to shore up the markets, because that's what governments did, shore up markets. And now the markets are shorting governments who are left with unemployment and huge fiscal deficits. Since then, we have been engaged in a discussion with respect to the economic recovery. And of course, economists defer, with all respect for economists, they defer in their analysis of how we got into this, and especially how we are going to get out of it. Some have claimed that uh, getting into the crisis and coming out was the form of a U, because the way we came in, we were going to come out. Others have claimed that it is much more V-shaped in terms of the recovery, yet others call it a W because of a double dip recession. And lastly, when I read some that were calling it like the symbol of a square root, because we came in, got out, and then the recovery was going to be very slow, I came to the personal conclusion that economists had at that point in time run out of letters in the alphabet to describe the crisis, and we were on to uncharted waters. <laughs> My main concern continues to be which direction we take in terms of getting out of the crisis and how we create economic growth and employment. And that is what the next 20 years are all about. The challenge we have, amigas y amigos, today and over the next 20 years is double. One, how do we win the war against poverty and inequality? Because today we have sufficient economic wherewithal and sufficient technological advancement so that people should not be subjected to living in the dire conditions that many millions are living around the world. It is morally and ethically unexcusable. And the second part of the challenge is how do we fight climate change successfully and bring down carbon emissions? So I would propose that we can accomplish both objectives, winning the war on inequality and poverty and reducing carbon emissions that create climate change by moving into a low carbon economy, 
which gives us a sense of direction in the way that we should be coming out of a crisis, not back into the past of what have been 200 years of an industrial revolution and an economic model, but into a very different future. Now, as if moving in that new direction were not challenging enough, because it is for the first time that humanity embarks in that direction, we are also faced with additional difficulties because of our starting point, which is the world today. And I will mention three in this respect. To begin with, today we live greater political or geopolitical tensions than at any other point in time after the coming down of the wall and the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Some of us that remember those episodes will recall also the dialogue of a peace dividend that would come after 60 years of Cold War in where we would be able to develop and create well-being and address health and education and infrastructure issues around the world like we had never been able to do so because after the Cold War we would be able to deploy our resources in that direction. Whether you look at the South China Sea or you look at the Korean Peninsula or you look at the challenges of migration in Europe or many other hot spots around the world such as the Middle East, geopolitical tensions are higher than they have ever been in the last 25 years. Secondly, the global economy is still a weak economy. Asia is growing half of what it was growing. Europe is not growing at all. And the US is growing 2 to 3% per year, which in and of itself is not sufficient to haul the global economy. Before I move on to my third condition, let me mention that these two, the geopolitical tension and the weak global economy, in the context of the US elections are challenges which I believe we can easily deal with. If we build walls around the world, we can do with geopolitical tension, and if we get others to pay for those walls, we will get the economy going, create jobs and opportunities, and solve both these problems. <laughs> so the third challenge that I want to mention is the one that I believe is much more relevant and where we should really put all of our emphasis. COP21 in Paris was successful in that it all set the world in a direction which we want to advance, but the truth is we live a planetary environmental emergency. Math does not lie. We have reached 400 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. Our present style of livelihoods and of development is accumulating another three to four parts per million per year. So take 35 years to the year 2050, which is just around the corner, multiply times four, 140 plus 400, 540. That is way over the 450 that 4,000 scientists say we should not surpass in the latest IPCC report if we do not want to move into a climate of plus or minus two degrees centigrade changes. And it is certainly way over the 350 parts per million, which some scientists are now claiming the world should come back to. That challenge, this emergency on the environmental side, is also perhaps compounded by four drivers which I want to mention. The first one is that never before have we witnessed the pressure of a growing population 
on a planet with limits to its resources. And perhaps here, of many examples, one can use the automotive industry. So four years ago, China became the number one market for the selling of automobiles. Today, China has about 150 or 160 vehicles per thousand inhabitants. The US has about 950 vehicles per thousand inhabitants. If the transportation system of the world is going to replicate the US model uh, with China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nigeria, South Africa coming up behind, we will be reminded of what Gandhi mentioned on the eve of Indian independence back in 47 when he was asked by a reporter if he then aspired Indians to live like they lived in the UK. And he thought about it and he said, it's taken the UK half the world's resources to live the way they do. India would need four or five planets for itself. Clearly, we have never faced the pressure of population growth on planetary limits as we do today. Secondly, we live in a planet, on a planet, which is energy starved. And I don't have to mention the many different transformations that the world of energy has gone through in the last 20 years. Uh, you know them well, from a world where energy was produced mainly in OECD countries to a world where, OEC where oil is produced outside OECD countries and in some countries that are, shall we say, uh, challenging geographies and political systems. Uh, we have gone through many different variations in the energy field, but thankfully, and I have to say uh, that if the present trend, trends continue, we may be seeing uh, a reinforcing factor here. Uh, last year, 286 billion invested in clean energy around the world, more than double of what was invested in coal, oil, and gas. And a third of that 286 billion invested in China alone. But yet again, we have a lot of coal, and we have a lot of oil, and we have a lot of gas, and prices are low, and that exerts additional pressure on an energy system that needs to change much faster even than it is changing today, and we yet don't know what the economic business model is to leave all of those hydrofossils in the ground and move on to a world of renewables. The third additional driver that complicates our environmental emergency is, of course, the consequences of climate change. And these you know well on water, health, agriculture. There was an interesting piece uh, last week on the effects of El Nino and climate change on the growing of salmon in Chile, which has become one of their major export items. Because of increased temperatures, they have algae blooming, which has poisoned 25 million salmons, is now decreasing export of salmons uh, by 15 to 20 percent out of Chile. Aside from the dramatic imp uh, impact, economic impact to farmers and to the Chilean economy, we can say, well, the world can live with less salmon. Yes, the world can live with less salmon. But translate that into something else that affects rice or staple foods in countries that absolutely need those staple foods. Translate those effects into new vectors that, uh, how do I say this? Uh, new, new vectors that propagate sicknesses to places where we had already eradicated them, such as uh, mosquitoes that are now reaching uh, uh, livelihoods in places of the planets where they never existed. Quite frankly, the challenges and the consequences of climate change are there and very real. And the fourth element that I will mention that complicates our environmental emergency 
is the dire state of our ocean. The ocean. Because it belongs to all, none of us really take care of it. It is the eighth continent on this planet. And we should worry ourselves about the health of a continent that is 70% of the world's surface. We should probably be called planet water, not planet Earth provides us with 50% of the oxygen, so every second breath in our lives is courtesy of the oxygen, of the ocean, fixes 25% of carbon emissions to an economic value that has been calculated of between 160 and 180 billion dollars per year, and on top of that provides us with 80 million tons of protein for livelihoods that live around oceans. Um, the ocean needs a plan to recovery because fish stock are down, some by 90%. 90%. It has trapped about 70% of the heat increase on the planet over the last decades, and that is causing an increase in acidification with the loss of biodiversity and life that we know about. So, in this situation of needing to advance to a low carbon economy that will, one, deal more effectively with poverty and inequality, and two, deal with lowering carbon emissions, but faced with this starting point that I have just mentioned and its complications, if we continue to do the same efforts, we will continue to have the same results. I mentioned the Industrial Revolution as being over, and I believe that we need to adopt that mindset as we move forward. The future is definitely a low-carbon economy, and more than a challenge, I would like to get our communications straight and say that it is by far the most encompassing, exhilarating, greatest economic opportunity humankind has ever been faced with. To be able to reinvent everything as we move forward from our point of departure in terms of reinventing transportation, energy systems, the way we produce, the way we work, the way we live, the way we organize ourselves as communities is a great economic opportunity and a field ripe for entrepreneurs, new business models, and new opportunities to create jobs and economic growth. We have the capital to do that. We have the resources to do that. Nick Stern, in the Stern Review of several years ago, called for an investment of about 1% of global GDP in terms of reconverting the economy and shifting it to low carbon. Think of that as an insurance policy that we are willing and able and capable of investing in just to guarantee that life on the planet continues to be what it has been. Back in 2008, on the eve of the economic crisis, the International Monetary Fund issued $250 billion in what they call SDRs, Special Drawing Rights. That is kind of like quantitative easing uh, at the global level, more or less. The global economy did not even feel its impact. What we're talking about here is investing $100 billion per year in terms of shifting our economic structure to low carbon. So we have the resources. We have good tech, good technology, not for the full transition, but certainly to move a good amount along the way. And that stresses, in other words, the need to develop further technologies stresses the importance of 
the Center for Sustainable Systems here at the university, what you're doing in the school in terms of not looking at this uh, as silos, but looking at it across in a multidisciplinary way, which is the thought process we need to be able to move forward. A low carbon economy for which we have the resources and we have some of the technology at least to get us starting requires five elements that I would like to cite and give some examples of. One, it requires government vision. Two, it requires a vigorous private sector. Three, it requires centers of academic excellence that are going to continue to deliver the technologies. Fourth, it requires the capital to finance the transitions. And fifth, it requires a proper communication strategy. So let me illustrate these five elements. Government vision. There are governments that are planning ahead in terms of moving in this direction. Korea is a clear example of a country that to get out of the 2007 or 8 economic crisis, as I mentioned, began investing in this direction. Costa Rica, on the side of developing nations, is also a country that has done rather well. 25 to 30 percent of our national territory in national parks, a system in place to pay for environmental services, thanks to a lot of the work that we did with Dan Jansen, Mr. Van Putten, that you have supported in Costa Rica so generously. Last year, 98 percent of our energy requirements solved by renewable energies and continuing to move in that direction. Ecotourism as an economic activity that is today the second dollar earner in the country. There are ways of making and transforming the environment and the reduction of carbon emissions into a good, viable business opportunity that creates jobs and economic wherewithal. Secondly, a vigorous private sector. In my work at the Carbon War Room, we identify sectors of the global economy uh, where we can reduce carbon emissions, as the President kindly mentioned in his introduction this evening, at gigaton scale, because gigaton scale is important. Scale is important in order to achieve the shift in a profitable way. So let me give you uh, some examples of what this really means. Take the shipping industry. We have about 50,000 ships sailing the world's oceans. If you aggregate their carbon emissions, they are equivalent to an economy the size of a nation between Germany and Japan. That's what they emit. Now, these ships need to go up on a dry dock every five years. If you take advantage of that moment and you invest an additional one to two million dollars per ship, depending on the type of ship it is, you roll it off the dry dock five weeks later, consuming about 15 to 20 percent less energy. That's 15 to 20 percent less carbon emissions. And at the same time, you created jobs at the dry dock, new markets for technology startups and technology companies that are looking into everything related with shipping efficiency, from new plastic paints that lower the coefficient of drag for the hulls, all the way through sophisticated software for navigating uh, that brings down the consumption of energy. You've also created a new opportunity for banks to finance, for insurance companies, and you have elongated the life of valuable assets that are on the books of so many companies around the world. A second example of creating opportunities for a thriving business sector to step in to this with both feet is our work with island nations. So island nations around the world have some of the most expensive energy because of the fact that it is fossil fuel based, imported inefficiently, small quantities, old generators, degraded uh, 
distribution networks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in the Caribbean, your energy prices will typically be between 35 and 67 cents US per kilowatt hour. At those prices, any type of renewable is a viable business opportunity, especially in the Caribbean that has, beside its beauty and its people, two things, sun and wind. Tremendous opportunity for investment, creating jobs, new business models, economic wherewithal, what we need to get the world moving again, but in the right direction that we want to move it. Third, centers of academic excellence with an interdisciplinary approach. I mentioned before that for the first time, humanity is navigating these unchartered waters. Moving towards a low carbon economy has never been done before. And yes, we believe that we have the answers to some of the challenges, and there are some low-hanging fruit, particularly in the energy-related sector, but there are many more things that need to be looked at. So how do we achieve carbon neutrality beyond what we can reduce in the energy sector? And how do we go beyond carbon neutrality to actually sequester, once we have become a carbon neutral planet, how do we go beyond that to sequester a lot of the carbon that we have put up there over the last 200 years into the atmosphere? Who is going to invent the giant vacuum cleaner that all of a sudden, powered by renewables, is going to pull back down all of these carbon emissions and transform them into something that we can use in our productive lives. That calls for centers of academic excellence. University of Michigan. Other universities around the world looking at this in the way we should all participate to find proper solutions. And fifth, it requires a proper communication strategy. This, amigas y amigos, has to be seen as what it truly represents. This is not a cost. This is a benefit. This is not a challenge. It is, in a way. It's an opportunity. It is the greatest opportunity we have ever had. And we must communicate it in this new language of job creation, of linking the environment with the economy in the way that we now have increasing numbers of examples around the world that we can show to, point at, and that tell the true story about what we are able to do. In the final analysis, and with this I finish, amigas y amigos, this is all about living up to our responsibility as agents of change and exercising leadership. Every one of us here this evening, how many students at the university, Mr. President? 43. Every one of us here this evening, 43,000 students at this university of extraordinary academic endowment are privileged with respect to how so many other billions of people live around the world that would want to have a single chance to live the lives that we live. And that privilege comes together with a tremendous responsibility to live up to being the agents of change that we should be at this day and time. It can be done. We can pull together and move on in a world that will be much better, therefore much safer, and with greater well-being. Remember the ozone depletion challenge? The world 
came together after 1985, private sector decided to change the use of CFCs. The Montreal Protocol accompanied the private sector shift and became a UN regulatory framework. And 10 years later, nature had healed itself. That is no longer a challenge. It is a lesson of how the world pulled together to solve what at that point in time was a most critical challenge. As agents of change, we know we have the wherewithal, a lot of the technology, and the economic resources to pull this one forward. Moving into a low carbon economy is our destiny and the one that we should live up to with our actions and our leadership. We all go through life, friends, with a plan A, sometimes a plan B, or even a plan C, if everything else fails. But when it comes to the planet we share, there is no planet B. This is it. This one has to work. This one has to continue to be enjoyed by the future generations and to create the types of livelihoods and well-being that we all wish our families will have into the future. Muchísimas gracias. Les agradezco a todas y a todos su atención. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your perspectives and vision for addressing you know, two critical sustainability problems, you know, both um, looking at the global economy, poverty, and, and climate change. And uh, at this time, we're going to um, open it up for questions from the audience. So we have two microphones, and we'll alternate between the microphones. Please introduce yourselves first, and then answer your questions. So we'll start over on this side. Thank you. Oh, hello. My name is Erica Dunham, and I was wondering how the gas and oil industry, such as Brit British Petroleum, can be agents of change. Um, I really think that companies that have been in the fossil fuel business should look at themselves as being in the energy business. And being in the energy business, what they really, which, which is what they really are in, they should shift from one source of energy to another. The shift is not going to be an easy one. They have a tremendous amount of reserves in their assets and in their books, and that has gone into the financial markets, into the insurance companies, and to the price of their stock. But we should be able to sit down together with them, understand that they have a problem of transition, help them in that transition, and have them lead the world into new types of renewable energy. Hello. First of all, thank you so much for your talk. Um, so I think it's really interesting how you talk about the power of business and how finance can play a role in this fight to you know, be a more sustainable world and things like that. And you talk about um, how organizations and individuals have to lead with their actions and with their leadership in order moving forward. So I guess my question to you is, um, do you think that the University of Michigan should divest from fossil fuels? Do I think that, pardon me? The University of Michigan should divest from fossil fuels. Absolutely, yes. Thank you so much. Every other university should as well. The world should do that. Hi, I'm Lily Klein. I'm in the School of Natural Resources, and I used to live in the small town of San Luis de Monteverde. Maybe mm. you've heard of it. <laughs> 
And when I left there in the summer of 2014, they were paving the gravel road to Monteverde, which would make it a lot easier for tourists to come in, but also make it a lot easier for my neighbors to get to the hospital if necessary. Mm -hmm. But it occurred to me, is there a tipping point for ecotourism when the carbon impact of the people you're bringing in exceeds the carbon emissions that you're reducing. So how do you figure out where that tipping point is and what do you do when you reach it? Hmm. What, an, what, a, what a good question. And thank you for asking that because uh, we are confronted with this type of choices just about every day of our lives when we are in the formulation of policy. Um, obviously, the pavement of the road into Monteverde, which is the cloud forest, in Costa Rica and a very pristine site uh, and a great tourist attraction is a convenience for those that live there. Obviously, it also makes it much easier to access Monteverde and may create a condition like the one that you are mentioning. So certainly the least preferred option would be not to pave the road. People deserve to live well and to have the convenience, those that live there, of getting in and out whenever they need to do so in the most efficient of ways. But that is where I believe that public-private partnerships come together. Uh, and the role of regulation is so important. So it's not a free-for-all, everybody that wants to go up there gets to go up to Monteverde, but it's a scheduled visit that takes into consideration that the cloud forest can only take on X number of visitors and respect and live by that. Thank you for being in Monteverde. Hello. Uh, thank you uh, again for coming to speak today. I really uh, appreciated a lot of what you said. Um, I'm an uh, undergraduate. I'm a member of the fossil fuel divestment campaign here at the university. Um, and so I was happy to hear um, I guess your response to Rob's question. Um, a follow-up I have then is, uh, what words do you have or what might you say to an administration that has not even expressed interest in even looking at the possibility or feasibility of such a transition in our investments? I'm sure that the administration has looked at it because every administration around the world is looking permanently of where they're investing their funds, where they can maximize returns, and where the best economic return lies in terms of their future. Um, the Rockefeller family announced last week uh, that after having made their fortune in oil, in oil, as we know, 100 years ago, they are divesting completely from oil today. That divestment is obviously not being done overnight. Uh, students here at the university and their parents and everybody else that pays tuition loans or bank loans for tuition would not appreciate an automatic overnight divestment where the value of your assets go way down and therefore you're caught paying higher tuition fees. But I'm sure that a gradual, systematic, as fast as possible transition is what is called for and I would suspect that in spite of perhaps not talking about that, those trustees that are responsible for looking at the endowment uh, and how it's investment are looking in that direction. Certainly that, I believe, is the responsible way to look at things today. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Don Figueres. Uh, my name is Diego from Costa Rica, actually. Uh, De qué parte? <laughs> San Jose. De San Jose. I study in Incai. So. Bueno, pues ahora quiero conocerlo más. <laughs> Would be a uh, pleasure. Uh, so my question, I'm finishing my MBA here at the University of Michigan. And my question to you is how uh, leaders today, coming out of business school, coming out of different uh, curriculums, how can we have the most impact on sustainability in, our, in the business and cooperating with the government of our country? So mm -hmm. what kind of ideas and projects can individuals develop in order to make progress? What are you graduating in? I'm graduating, graduating in April. In April, ¿Qué, qué, qué, en qué profesión? Uh, MBA, the MBA, Incai. great. So, 
you know, look at, look at the environment as a business opportunity. As an MBA grad, look at the environment as a business opportunity. Whatever you're going to go back and do in Costa Rica, wherever you come into, I am sure that in the business that you're going to be working, there are going to be opportunities for demand side management in terms of energy use. There are going to be opportunities for better and more efficient resource allocation. There are going to be opportunities for putting a plan together that will make your corporation a carbon neutral corporation, follow global trends, become much more appealing in that way to the clients that your corporation will have. There are many different ways in which you can exercise leadership from the private sector. And you having had the privilege that few Costa Ricans have of studying abroad, I believe should take on an even greater responsibility in this respect. So I'd love to talk to you right after this. Thank you very much. No se me vaya. Hi, my name is Larry Drunk. I'm a professor in the medical school. Three different systems are discussed by which countries can help to move their economies away from producing so much CO2 from fossil fuels. And those are a carbon fee, cap and trade system, or a regulatory approach. Would you favor one of those approaches, or is there some other approach? So I am uh, in favor of a price on carbon. Full stop, end of story. We put a price on carbon, all of a sudden we internalize those economic externalities, and all of a sudden we start taking decisions in a much better way. Now, I believe that the world is a long way from putting a price on carbon today. But it will come. In the meantime, I'm for all of the above that you mentioned. It's going to take different forms and shapes in different geographies and economies to put this together. So Europe has a cap and trade program. Uh, China is beginning, has already begun seven different markets in cap and trade uh, as an experience into seeing how they're going to deal with this. Incidentally, uh, of the countries that are doing most today in terms of lowering carbon emissions, it's the Chinese government for different reasons, because of pollution. But if you look and read their 13th five-year plan that just is going into uh, its first year this year as we talk here, uh, it has a tremendous amount of action uh, in terms of moving towards a low carbon economy. In the case of Costa Rica, we placed a fuel tax or a tax on fuel back in 1995 uh, as an article in a forestry law. Uh, and the thought process was, when you're going to be, be buying pump, uh, fuel at the pump, uh, you're going to be burning that, emitting carbon, so let's already tax that uh, and take those proceeds to finance an environmental services fund, which is what we have done very successfully. Uh, there's hardly any evasion of taxes when you collect it at the fuel pump. Uh, so we should look for things that are simple, easy to do, but that begin through different instruments to put a price on carbon. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Eric. Um, I'm also from Costa Rica. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, Costa Rica's transportation system is based on fossil fuels. Yep. Um, the efficiencies of railroads are well known, and uh, you famously, or not famously, but you, during your administration, uh, closed, closed down the, the fair railroad. Yes, closed off the railroad. Yes. Now, as the leader of the Partido Liberación Nacional, do you think that closing off the railroads in Costa Rica at that time was short-sighted, and what are you doing now mm -hmm. to perhaps improve the efficiency of the transportation systems in Costa Rica? Mm -hmm. And the second one, sorry, is um, my second question is, developed nations have, uh, have become rich by exploiting not only their natural resources, but sometimes other nations' resources, developing countries. What do you think the role of developed nations in helping developing nations uh, achieve sustainability should be? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. So with respect to transportation, I mentioned that uh, last year about 98% of our power requirements were generated from renewables. And that will continue to hold as a trend as we move forward because the country is investing in more renewables. The one big issue that we have to deal with, which you have correctly identified, is, is transportation, which is fossil fuel. Uh, and there, as we move forward, we need to move as fast as possible into electrics and hybrids. A vehicle in Costa Rica travels an average of 55 kilometers a day. Any EV today does more than 55 kilometers a day. And as we move forward in this realm, we should look for differentiated ways of being able to put the financing mechanisms behind the purchase of EVs and hybrids. When you buy an internal combustion vehicle, you don't buy the gasoline that is required to run it for the next 10 years, as you are required to buy today the battery that runs your electric EV. So if we find models to lease the battery, purchase the car, other financial models, we can begin to move in that direction. When I closed the railroad back in 95 or 96, it was absolutely the correct measure to take. At that point in time, a 200-year-old railroad, which had not been maintained for decades, was no longer competitive with trucking in Costa Rica. Furthermore, you had had a very important systemic shift in the way of transportation with roll-on and roll-off models of transportation. So cargo was no longer coming as bulk into the country to be inefficiently loaded on an inefficient railroad, it was coming on containers that need platforms and tractor trailers to be transported. When you take the distance between Punta Arenas and San Jose, which is less than 150 kilometers, and you take the distance between San Jose and Limón on the Atlantic, which is also about 170 kilometers, and you look at the gradients that are required to go up from zero to 1,200 meters, in that short a distance, with our topography, putting in a rail system uh, that is a modern rail system today to transport cargo is far beyond what would be competitive for the country's positioning vis-a-vis -vis the global economy. Today what we need is massive, rapid, electric transportation. And that should be a combination of cars, buses, and a rapid train system using the right of way that the railway still has between Alajuela and Paraíso in a first stage, and then a second stage, probably take it down to San Ramon. And I'd be glad to talk with you about it. Hopefully you'll come back after studying and help us make it. I just want to say, don't hand any more to the line. We want to make sure we can get through. Go ahead. Hi, my name's Braxton Mashburn. Um, I am sorry to report that I am not from Costa Rica. <laughs> <laughs> we'll adopt you. <laughs> However, I am a non-traditional graduate student at the School of Natural Resources and the Ross School of Business. Um, you very eloquently mentioned your five-pronged approach for a low-carbon economy. Um, one of the only entity, and I guess the only strategy or prong within that five-pronged approach that I don't think you mentioned uh, very clearly was unlocking capital markets. I don't mm -hmm. know if that was by omission or commission, but uh, I'd be interested in hearing your perspectives on how do we unlock that potential that we already have. Mm -hmm. um, you're absolutely right, and thank you for your observation. I did mention as one of the five points that we needed to move in this direction. Um, looking through my notes here capital to finance the transition. So on that note, you're absolutely correct. Today there are many barriers to being able to move capital and allocating it in the creation of a low carbon economy. Many of those barriers have to do with regulatory environments that we're still stuck with and that point the economic direction in a different way. So it does require enlightened leadership government action, new regulatory frameworks 
that will begin to shift the direction in which capital is allocated. Uh, Gordon Bigelow. I'm a, just a citizen of Ann Arbor. You've already partly answered my question, but um, the private automobile is a microcosm of territoriality that people can carry around with them as they travel. And it is a social phenomenon as well as a technology. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that it's still taking the world by storm. Um, many, many people in China drive private automobiles now who 10 years ago even did not. And so um, I'd like to have your impressions of the future of the private automobile as a social phenomenon because people in this country are having a very difficult time making the transition to using public vehicles. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a phenomenon on which you do not have the monopoly here in the United States, but it's a worldwide phenomenon. Interesting to see on that same note how in the last 20 years we have gone from a China where the streets were dominated by bicycles to being dominated by vehicles. And in Copenhagen, we have gone from streets dominated by vehicles to streets dominated by bicycles. It says something about development and where we should be looking at in terms of leapfrogging. I believe that we are at the verge of a revolution with respect to the model of ownership of vehicles, and that ownership will be shared ownership. A lot of the incipient models that we are beginning to see today, uh, and that we will come to understand that what we need a vehicle for is to transport ourselves safely and efficiently from point A to point B. Uh, that for the rest of it, it is a status symbol, which we no longer should need. It locks up a lot of our capital, especially in the developing world, and we use it about maybe 10 or 20% of the time, and the rest of the time it's completely unused. So how do we achieve that social transformation? I'm not sure of. I go about um, in my own country uh, saying that my objective in life is never to have a vehicle again in my own name. Uh, between the combination of taxis, Ubers, buses, uh, friends and relatives, and whatever, uh, I never expect to have to own a vehicle again. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, better, better ways of utilizing uh, savings and capital. Uh, buenas noches, senor. Uh, my name is Trey Helwig. I had the privilege of living in Costa Rica for a semester, and actually to uh, represent my commitment, I am actually holding one of my favorite snack foods, chiqui, mm. <laughs> which I just had around the house. But um, uh, apart from that, yes, I'll hold it for just a second while the question. <laughs> um, so my question relates to the fact that this would be, uh, accomplishing this would be in a approach related to sustainable uh, development. Mm -hmm. You mentioned multidisciplinary, uh, I guess a multidisciplinary approach and incorporating uh, public universities such as this one. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about this from the standpoint that we have a very great pressure in society r right now to pursue uh, STEM fields in the university, um, science, technology, and so forth. Um, and I'm curious how this incorporates the other fields, or if it does, if you're looking to uh, address this from a non-technocratic standpoint. So I am sorry, uh, but I must confess very, very shallow knowledge in that field, and I'm not qualified to answer your question. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Armand Godrokian. I'm a graduate student at the University of Michigan at uh, Ford School of Public Policy and School of Natural Resource and Environment. 
during the last two years, I've been involved with uh, many of these UN negotiations. I was in Paris last December mm -hmm. when this deal uh, made through, and also in Lima, Peru, two years ago. Uh, something that I observed is throughout this negotiation is that what we all believe is missing is not actually what is missed. So we think that science, technology, and finance are the big problems. But what I observe is that something else. Um, so I want to explain a little bit why I think that way, and I mm -hmm. want uh, to ask you what do you think is missing. Uh, so we are pretty much sure that the science is there. So we're more than 98% of yep. the scientists say climate change is happening and it's mm -hmm. real. The technology is there with, the, with today's level of technology of solar, batteries, EV, wind, all of these resources we can power the whole planet if we want. And the finance, which is the most controversial, is almost there. Uh, the total fund that has been asked for climate change is $100 billion, mm -hmm. which is less than 0.5% of the US GDP. Mm -hmm. The Iraq war and Afghanistan cost the US, the US only $6 trillion that could fund the whole climate uh, finance for 60 years. So to me, the short answer is the science, technology, and finance is there, but there's something else missing. So as a politician, I want to ask you what is missing and what is the solution to get there? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good question. So I think it's an issue of leadership and of assuming the challenges that we have today. Unfortunately, in this country, sustainability and climate change have become completely ideologized. So here you have we are in the middle or almost in the middle of a political campaign and there is not one single word that is expressed about how to deal with climate change, how we're going to live up to COP21, how we're going to become a leader in this and how we're going to become a, how we're going to transform this into a business opportunity. Think of the amount of technology that we could export from the developed world into the developing world and put the financing behind that that is going to benefit the financial un the, uh, institutions of the developed world in order to enable them to leapfrog uh, and skip over whatever remnants they have of industrial revolution processes into a new low carbon economy. The, you know, wh when one takes the aggregate commitments of countries at COP21, where every country said, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this. I don't look at that as a constraint. I look that, at that as a giant order book of infrastructure investment that is there for the taking by the most efficient, forward-reaching companies in the world. That's what it is. It's a giant order book of infrastructure that will create jobs and economic opportunities and wherewithal. So I think it's a cultural attitude with respect to this. It may be a general attitude, a, a generation one as well. I don't think so. I think it's much more of a cultural mindset uh, and a kind of being complacent with the status quo uh, in, in an almost irresponsible way uh, when the science, as you say, is so clear. Um, buenas tardes, Don Jose. Um, my name is Martina Lugo. I'm a student at the College of Engineering. I'm majoring in Computer Science Engineering. Um, I'm from San Jose, Costa Rica. Um, this is my last year here. And it's a great city. <laughs> Wonderful country. I've heard of it. Um, <laughs> and well, it's a, it's a pleasure. It was a pleasure listening to you this afternoon. Uh, my question was um, regarding foreign investment in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. So as a developing nation, Costa Rica is very dependent on multinationals coming in, creating great opportunities, mm -hmm. such as how you brought, um, you took the initiative of bringing Intel to Costa Rica. So how does Costa Rica keep the door open to foreign investment, but at the same time, it prioritize sustainable development? Mm -hmm. Because most of these multinationals don't share the same values that we share for the environment. So um, thank you for the question. I, I would have to say that increasingly, multinationals are looking at their corporate carbon footprint with a lot more care than they used to. It's become not only an issue of how they portray themselves into the marketplace, it's also become an issue for them of how they hire you. 
Because when you and your generation are going to an interview now, one of the questions you ask most frequently from a company is, what's your environmental policy? And if you're not satisfied in your generation with their environmental policy, you're likely to turn that job down. And so that has corporations rethinking in terms of how they position themselves and how they have an adequate uh, footprint or a much more responsible position with respect to the environment. Secondly, in the case of Costa Rica and in the case of any country, I'm a great believer in looking at the niches of comparative advantage or where you are competitive in the global scenario. So Costa Rica has four or five niches in where it can grow jobs, investment from international sources and national sources as well. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Uh, one is deployment of solar. Uh, the country can easily today, in a system with an output of 2,700 megawatts, absorb between 200 and 300 megawatts of solar. Uh, that is a huge investment uh, for internationals or nationals. It creates jobs in terms of deploying, especially in a decentralized way. Uh, not centralized solar, but decentralized on rooftops. It creates income for households, jobs, opportunities, maintenance, etc. cetera. Uh, another one is moving towards biocombustibles. So Costa Rica that imports about 60,000 barrels of fuel, going back, sir, to your question on transportation, that's what we import today, 60 barrels of fuel, could replace 50% of that by going into biofuels, uh, for which there's enough research already done in Costa Rican universities such as CATIE and El Tecnológico de Costa Rica. There are other activities where the country has a huge potential and that have a very low carbon footprint. For example, medical tourism. Uh, a tourist uh, in Costa Rica produces $1,200 per visit, average. Uh, a medical tourist produces between $12,000 and $15,000. Of those, we're already receiving $50,000. A year, but we could easily uh, receive 300,000 with the capacity that we have installed already in hospitals, both private and public hospitals, in a public-private partnership. And with 300 million North Americans and a health system in the U.S. that is well aligned to increase cost day in and day out, <laughs> we have a secure market moving forward for everything that is not emergency medical treatments. So there, there's another tremendous opportunity. And we could talk about two or three other niches where the country is competitive in industries that have a low carbon footprint. So when do you finish your studies here? April. A lot of Costa Ricans going back in April. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. We clearly need more government leaders with, with your vision and uh, wisdom. And uh, we'd like to thank you for your lecture and your careful response to all the uh, good questions that we had today. Um, let's once again thank President Fugueras for his time here at the university, his lecture, time with our students. Thank you for showing up and not being a Calgary. <laughs> <laughs> so please join us for a reception uh, with, with President Fugueras. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Wagey lecture in the fall when we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the center. Thank you.